Um, you know, when, when you hear uh, the words thunder lizards, I think you all probably associate that with Mike Maples, and that's because he coined the term, which has now become analogous to basically outsized exits. And um, I really love that. Uh, I love the, the term thunder lizards because it's become his branding. And um, hey, Pierre, since you're right there, maybe you can shut that door. Thanks. And um, it's great branding. And in a world where you have to differentiate yourself, I think uh, you know he's pretty smart to figure out. You know, I'm going to uh, term thunder lizards, and there's no. You know, you're not going to be mistaken about what you're looking for, right? You're not looking for small bets. Um, the other thing is that I think it's really refreshing. So I started covering this industry in 1999, and, and back then everything was big, you know, big home runs, and, um, and big was beautiful. And fast forward, and it's become really the norm over the last several years to think of, of making smaller bets and more frequent bets. And you heard in the last panel, the last couple panels, you know, thinking about exits for aqua hires or, you know, going to second base or third base. And there's nothing wrong with having companies with those exits. Um, but it's not that inspiring. You know, you don't want to have an aqua, aqua hire. You want to you think big. And so I think it's really refreshing that um, even though Mike is doing seed stages, um, investments. He's only doing about five a year, and uh, Anne, your partner's probably doing five, five a year. But it's not Google Ventures doing 80. No, it's not. You know, it's not a number of bets. And so when you're doing, when you're that selective, I think you really have to dial into what you're looking for, and you really have to have a strategy and philosophy um, around what makes you choose um, and find that that entrepreneur you're going you're going to invest in. And so, um, and that's his thunder lizard. Philosophy, and I think you're going to be really inspired to think big. Um, so I'm looking forward to his presentation. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And um, I, I suppose, uh, Paul, are you in the room right now? Yeah. There you are. Okay. And, and I think I saw Chris Law as well um, behind that light. Okay. Um, and the, the reason I bring that up is, um, you know, we've had some pretty good luck in recent years, but um, there was a time. Um, so I, I moved out to Silicon Valley in 2005, and um, I thought I wanted to be a VC. And uh, the only challenge with that was that no firm would hire me to be a partner. Uh, and so that's a little bit of a hurdle. And so uh, uh, Foundation Capital was nice enough to uh, indulge me for nine months. And so I hung out there as an entrepreneur in residence, but they sort of said, hey, it, it's not gonna work out. Um, but we'd sure like to work with you. We, we're, we're, we're still good friends. And so then I went over to August Capital and, uh, and then, uh, and then it, it turned out that that wasn't gonna work out and that, but we were gonna stay friends. And um, I was like, okay, hmm. Uh, and you know, sometimes people will say to you, you know, you were a pretty good entrepreneur and now you've been unsuccessful at uh, winning the affection of two firms. Has it ever occurred to you, you don't know what the heck you're doing? And, uh, and, then, and then not only that, to add insult to injury, I'd been talking to Paul and Chris for several months. And every time I saw their deal, I passed on it. Uh, the first time I passed on it, I think that it was called like Start Page 2.0 or some, 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 some random name. And there was, they had some directory of web services. And I was like, I hate that name. And, and the second time I saw them, I think they were gonna call it Aggregate Knowledge. And I don't think I even liked that name. Uh, but I said, I, I don't think you're close enough to the money. And then, then I get a call from Paul one day, a week after August Capital had said that uh, it's, it's a no-go. And uh, he said, hey, well, guess what? We just got funded by Kleiner Perkins. And I just thought, God, you know, this just sucks, man. I'm a loser. And, uh, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Uh, but then he says, no, 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 that's not what we think at all. Uh, you know, we really enjoyed our meetings. We thought you were a good guy, and so uh, you know, we thought we thought we'd make you an advisor to Aggregate Knowledge. And I was like, okay, you know, sure, I'll be an advisor to Aggregate Knowledge. But um, you know, I always remembered that it was like one of the one of the first good things that ever happened to me. Uh, there were you know, there were only two good things that happened to me in the first 18 months trying to be a VC. That and uh, Kevin Rose letting me invest in Dig after I threatened to go on hunger strike in his apartment uh, if, if, uh, if he didn't let me. So, uh, you know, 
uh, I guess every, everybody faces sort of that moment of the, the moment of death and the moment of truth. And uh, Paul, um, I always remembered that that um, that we would we'd have the entrepreneurs back. So I thank you guys very much um, from the bottom of my heart. Okay. So the topic at hand: thunder lizards. Uh, so who knows what a thunder lizard is? And just just to, to level set. Okay, so not that many people. So um, I, I, uh, when I went to business school, uh, people tended to use a lot of terms that were sort of high-minded, MBA jargon sounding. Uh, so for example, uh, people talked about disruptive ideas or people talked about um, synergy and you know, that fancy sounding MBA kind of words. And I was always looking for a term that captured the huge startup that came out of nowhere and destroyed markets and uh, you know, changed the world and did legendary things. And so um, I got the term Thunder Lizard from Godzilla. And uh, I don't know how many of you have ever watched a Godzilla movie, but Godzilla was hatched from radioactivated atomic eggs and then uh, swims across the Pacific Ocean, uh, emerges with an attitude, and then uh, begins to create disruption. And so the boat here is, the boat is representative of initial startup competitors, uh, followed by this building here, which represents uh, larger companies and markets that the Thunder Lizard dominates. And then eventually, the Thunder Lizard wildly disrupts even the incumbents, which are then represented by these sausage link train cars. And so, to me, like, it's all about the Thunder Lizards. Uh, to me, the high-tech business is one of exceptionalism, period, the end. And, you know, what I find remarkable and awesome and fabulous about today's world is that the capital requirements to start a company have collapsed in the last 10 years, and so it lets little guys like me compete for the opportunity to invest in Thunder Lizards. Uh, you know, to me, that was, the, that, that was the insight that I started to have, you know, about seven or eight years ago. So one of the things that I, I think a lot about, like especially conferences and like such as this, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of things, I'm sure, the Series A crunch and then, you know, the next new incubator model, the next new accelerator model, you know, is it going to happen outside of Silicon Valley, is it going to happen outside the U.S., all that, all that kind of cool stuff. But what I often think about is why aren't more entrepreneurs trying to build thunder lizards and why aren't more seed funds focused on finding them? And so I thought I, would, I thought I would share some ideas that I thought might be useful for people who are interested in uh, getting involved either as an entrepreneur or as an investor in some of the outsized, uh, you know, totally wildly asymmetric outcomes. And I would like to say that these insights are based on me being smart, but for the most part, these are based on me being lucky enough to hang out with some people uh, that were smart, and I just took careful notes. And so, the concept that I really want to get across is this idea that I like to call exponential entrepreneurship. And I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous about this speech because you're kind of watching sausage being made. I'm not really sure that my ideas are very well formed. And so part of what I'm hoping is that I'll get a lot of criticism for some of these ideas so that I can refine them and make them better. Uh, so if, if parts of it look a little bit rough, uh, it's not just you thinking that. Um, so part one of exponential entrepreneurship, uh, two basic laws. Uh, the first law is one that we probably all know pretty well. It's called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law was coined by Gordon Moore of Intel. Uh, and it basically states that the performance of computing doubles at the same unit cost every 18 months. And um, I look at, you know, a lot of people just, they know Moore's Law and they blow right past it uh, because it's just so obvious and fundamental. But Moore's Law, to me, animates the magic of the tech industry. Um, we forget how lucky we are sometimes. There's bubbles all the time. There have been tulip bubbles. There have been financial services bubbles. There was a mortgage bubble. Uh, there was even an internet bubble once. But the thing that's true about our industry that I've never seen in any industry ever, and I can't think of any, any industry like this in human history, is we get to ride the wave of doubling performance every 18 months. And what that, that guarantees us a couple of things. That guarantees us that no matter how powerful any company is in the world, 
there will always be a startup someday along the line that can disrupt their incumbent advantage. It, over a given amount of time, there will always be a new supply of awesome companies. It's guaranteed by Moore's law as long as Moore's law happens. And so you're gonna always have a PC wave that displaces the mainframe as the most important computing architecture. Then you're gonna move to client server. Sorry, the Mac didn't translate too well. And then the internet and then social networking. But any situation where you have a doubling of every 18 months, no matter how powerful an incumbent is, give the tech business as long as you would like and it will displace it. And so that's the first thing. Now the second law is uh, I think less understood. Just a show of hands, how many people know what a power law is? Okay, so that whereas how many people knew what Moore's law was? Okay, everybody, right? Um, so this is the more counterintuitive of the two laws in my opinion, uh, the power law. So the power law states that the biggest outcome is bigger than all the others combined and so on. So for example, for example, uh, this is the power law in practice. 10,000 to 20,000 companies will be funded by angels in a typical year. 1,000 to 2,000 will get VC funding. 50 to 100 of them won't suck. And we define don't suck as exit is more than 50 million. 10 plus or minus five will be special. But this is the one that blows my mind. In a typical year, the best exit of that year is more valuable than all of the companies combined. I would bet you that if you looked at the Facebook exit, it was more valuable than all 9,999 companies combined that were started in 2004. And people say, okay, yeah, well that's Facebook, but who comes next? I don't know, maybe LinkedIn. It was probably more valuable than all the rest combined. Who's next? I don't know, maybe Workday. But isn't that wild to think about? I mean, like, it's kind of interesting to intellectualize, but it's just, it's just so counterintuitive to our existence to think that the best company of the year will create more wealth than all other companies started that year combined. And that is a feature of our industry that I think we often overlook. And so most of us think, when I, like when I went to business school, we talked about normal distribution of outcomes. And so most people, let's be honest, even most angel investors or most VCs think in terms of, well, I have a, a set of investments and I got my average mu muddy middle, maybe I make money to break even a little bit, sort of, and then I've got the losers and then I got the winners. And you know, the winners are the companies that perform a standard deviation better than everybody else. That turns out to be wrong in my opinion. Uh, let me just give you a sense of this. So in my angel portfolio, one of my investments was Twitter. Uh, Twitter right now is um, probably about 250 times in the money from the time that, that I invested. None of the other angel investments matter. It doesn't even matter if the other ones were good. It doesn't matter that another one of my angel investments was Yumi Networks. It doesn't matter. It'll be a good return too, but if I had gotten Yumi and not Twitter, the fundamental dynamics of my angel portfolio would have been different. And all of my other angel investments could have been good, but not having Twitter fundamentally changes the character of it. By the way, if I'd done just Twitter and everything else sucked, I would have had an awesome angel portfolio. Um, in the first fund that I raised on my own in 2006, uh, demand force by itself returned almost three times the fund at exit. And so, does it matter whether I have a couple of two baggers or five baggers, or I get dual track exits? Yeah, I mean, it kind of matters, but not really. What really matters is I got into demand force. Um, Paul Graham wrote a piece, I, I, and I thought, well, okay, maybe that's just true for my funds, or maybe that's just true for angel stuff, or maybe that's just true for limited situations. You know, Paul Graham wrote an essay a few months ago that said that Dropbox is worth more than all 500 plus other Y Combinator companies combined. And that the next best one, Airbnb, is worth more than all the subsequent ones combined, and so on and so on. So what I find to be the most important question for any startup is, can I leverage the asymmetric power of Moore's Law to create one of the 10 best companies of the year? To me, that is the fundamental assignment of an entrepreneur. That is the objective function of an entrepreneur who's trying to create a, a really great company. And too many startups have entrepreneurs who are just doing entrepreneurship, but they're not, they're not asking that sort of basic fundamental question. Okay, so the second thought, 
exponential reasoning versus linear reasoning. So linear thinking is kind of intuitive. So um, linear thinking is what I use when I brush my teeth every day or when I drive to work every day. Like when I get in my car to drive to work, I don't say, huh, I wonder, existentially, should I go to work this way? Uh, should I even be in a car? Why are there cars? I just get in the car, I go to work. I brush my teeth, I go to work, I go to my first meeting. Linear reasoning, linear thinking. thinking. Exponential thinking is not. And this is why I like to use the Einstein analogy. So for example, intuitive linear reasoning is observable. Like, F equals M, you know, like if I drop this clicker from 20 feet tall, it's gonna hit the ground at a faster rate than if I drop it from two feet tall. We can kind of intuitively grasp that the speed that it's gonna fall is a function of time square. You can, once you hear that formula, you're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense to me. F equals MA. You can, you can prove it also with an observable experiment. Well, Einstein, some of you may remember this, a lot of the things that he used to talk about when he talked about the general theory of relativity were thought experiments. They couldn't be proved in a lab, proven in a lab. In fact, when Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity, um, a lot of people thought he was smoking weed because they're just like, it just makes no sense to me and I just can't see it. I can't see quantum mechanics in the way that I can see an object falling from, from the ceiling, for example. Uh, and so some of you may remember his thought experiments where he'd say, like, pretend you're in an elevator going at the speed of light, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, I can't remember exactly, you know, my science grades weren't all that great, but uh, one of the things that I remember was a lot of people in the world didn't believe Einstein until like 1919. And he said, well, the way I can prove that I'm right is there's gonna be some kind of an eclipse in 1919, and if Newton's right, the rays are gonna bounce at this part of the ocean, and if I'm right, they're gonna bounce at this part of the ocean. I can't remember exactly, I'm probably butchering the story. But, but it turned out that they bounced the way Einstein said it would bounce. And from that point on, he was a worldwide celebrity. You know, he went from being an esoteric people person that a lot of guys thought might be right, and a lot more thought was smoke and weed, to you know, the most important scientist and theoretical physicist in the world. Okay, so, this is one of the problems then I see happening with entrepreneurship sometime is people tend to reason by analogy rather than reason up from first principles. And so I talked a little bit about reasoning by analogy. You know, it's a characteristics of linear thinking. Like, let me give you examples of reasoning by analogy and I'll give you some more in a second. But when somebody says, what pain do you solve? That's a great example of reasoning by analogy. Whereas reasoning by first principles is when Bill Gates says, Computers aren't going to be expensive someday. So the, the relative importance of software computers will flip-flop. So that's a, that's, a, that's a different thought process than what pain do you solve when you, when you launch the company. Um, and the other, the other really important point, and I'll get into this, when you're reasoning by first principles, you can't prove anything in the real world yet. So what you have to do is you have to solicit negative feedback as it relates to your first principles. Not, do I think I'm gonna get traction or not, you know, uh, a, a set of, of more mundane questions. So reasoning by analogy number one, this by the way is why I think that um, when I went to Harvard Business School, it was a great experience, but I had to unlearn a lot of things in terms of how to, how to think about tech entrepreneurship. Uh, the case method literally is uh, the pattern matching paradigm. And uh, pattern matching, I think, is useful, but only after you have the winning idea. You know, pattern matching won't tell you what to start. It might tell you how to get there better once you've started the right thing. Here's another one that I like, lean startup customer development religion. Uh, you know, I, I, I've had startups pitch me before that say, we're, we're, you know, we're gonna be a lean startup. That's how they start out. I'm like, great, what's your, what's your basic idea? What's the, what is the contrarian idea that you have that's gonna change the world? Well, you know, we're, we're lean and we can b bob and jive and weave and do all this stuff and so it almost doesn't matter if we have the right idea at first because we're so fast and lean that we can pivot just like you read about. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Um, this one is one of my favorites of recent times, glassogram. So companies by analogy. So. Um, 
like this is this is something that you'll get different opinions on. Sometimes when you go to the internet and you look at how to be appealing to an investor or an angel investor or VC, you need to have the tagline. You need to have the phrase that pays. And VCs understand stuff they already understand. So we're this for that. You know, come up with your shorthand. Now, in my personal case, if I see a we're this for that pitch, I eliminate it immediately. Because I know that that entrepreneur is engaging in a thought process that isn't compatible with what I'm looking for in a, in a startup. So I'm gonna give a few examples that I think are good. So I gave the Bill Gates example for a second. Bill Gates, I saw him dedicate the computer science facility at UT, so I took this picture of him. And uh, he said something that I thought was kind of cool. Um, he said, you know, when I was in high school, everybody believed computers were expensive. And he said, the important thing to understand is not that everybody was stupid or everybody was even wrong-headed. Because if you had grown up in the world before he was a high school student playing with personal computers in the Mitz Altair, you would not have been able to conceive of the idea that computers could be cheap. I mean, computers were, being expensive was as common understanding as the law of gravity. It was just a truism at the time. And so Bill understood that they're not gonna always be expensive. And in, in a future world where they're not expensive, whole new types of companies are gonna be valuable that nobody thinks of as valuable today. Software used to be the thing you gave away to sell a mainframe, but someday computing's gonna be roughly free and then software is going to become the, the, the thing that matters the most. Um, so diagnostic test number one, uh, most people believe X is true, but the truth is not X. Uh, and this is one of the things I like. Um, you know, this is Peter Thiel's rendering of the statement. Uh, another, the, like my rendering of the statement is, why are you non-consensus and right? Uh, but, but, but it's sort of kind of the same insight. You know, Nobody ever has unconventional success with conventional thinking ever. Now you could be unconventional and wrong, in which case you're hosed, but having some unconventional idea about the way the world is about to be is a, is a precursor to great success. And we, can't, we cannot allow ourselves to invest in a company that cannot articulate that clearly. Okay, the second point. So, uh, Evan Williams. So uh, there was another, you know, I kind of had a Forrest Gump-like first year and a half, and in spite of the fact that I got bounced out of every venture firm that I talked to and nobody would hire me, uh, the first investment I ever made was this company called Odeo, and I thought podcasting was gonna be a big deal. And then a week later, Apple decides to give podcasting away on iTunes. So I was like, oh crap, uh, we're out of business. So. Ev was the founder of Odeo, and uh, he tried really hard to make it into something. But after about a year, he said, look, we just don't have a business here, and I'm just gonna give all the investors their money back. And I was like, you know, you don't owe me anything. I took a risk, whatever, just, you know. He said, no, some of my investors are kind of disenchanted, and I've kinda, I kind of have to give the money back, and so I need you to take it back. And I said, I said okay, uh, twist my arm, right? But, but um, but I said, well, what, you know, okay, as, under one condition, you let me invest in your next company. You know, I don't care if it's a massage parlor, right? Just, I get to invest in your next company. And he says, well, I don't have a company, but I got this side thing, and I don't know if it's a product, much less a company. And I said, what is it? And he goes, it's called Twitter. And at the time, it was, he said, we're not sure what to call it. It was spelled T-W-T-T-R, or voicemail 2.0. We're not sure what to call it yet. And I said, okay, what does it do? Uh, you say what you're doing, and then, okay, cool, yeah, I'm, I'm with you so far. Uh, he's like, uh, in 140 characters or less. And I'm like, okay, well then what happens? And he goes, that's it, that's all it does. And I said, uh, uh, so what is, uh, what's, the, what's the road map? There is no road map. Uh, what is the revenue model? There is no revenue model. Okay. So uh, why do you think this is a company then? And he said, well, I don't know if it is. But he goes, you know, here's my thinking. When I, did, when I invented Blogger, we got a million people to write blogs. And then I did podcasting, and it was harder to do a podcast than a blog. You had to know something about audio, you had to put things together, you had to do RSS stuff. He goes, I decided to kind of go in the opposite direction. You know, if a million people write blogs, maybe 10 million people would write microblogs. And if 10 million people wrote microblogs, 
I'm not sure how to monetize that, but I am pretty sure that the burden of proof would be on the people who are negative at that point. And so I was like, he's right. Like, I don't know, I still had no idea. I didn't know what promoted tweets would be. I didn't know that they were gonna be, you know, behind the Arab Spring or that like they'd be on Oprah or any of that stuff. But it was that, that first principle idea that, you know, if I could get an order of magnitude more people doing this form of blogging, then I think I have something. Then I think I have a, a real business. Uh, this is another diagnostic test, therefore. So Ev knew that he understood blogging. He had authentic wisdom about it. He knew that nobody else was doing microblogging, and he knew that he could do it well. And so this is the diagnostic, you know, the, the intersection of that Venn diagram is what valuable company is nobody building today? Okay, third example, Elon Musk. This is my favorite one. The reason this is my favorite example is because people misunderstand the profound greatness of what he's doing with SpaceX. Most people, I think, believe that SpaceX is a way to fill the vacuum of leadership by our underinvestment in our space program and NASA. And there's an element of truth to that. And you could argue that SpaceX is a lean NASA, but that's not the big idea in my view. The big idea is that Elon had the insight that 0.3% of the cost of space travel is the rocket fuel, which gets burned up, obviously. And the rest of it is the cost of the rocket, which gets destroyed. And so if you make a reusable rocket, you, you impact the, the cost of space travel 100-fold or more. And so that's an example of first principle thinking uh, applied even to space travel. So, it's like, what is your big secret is, is the third diagnostic test that I have. And they're all, it's related to being non-consensus, but it's, it's an insight that you have that's exponential that the rest of the world hasn't quite discovered is, is the third one. It can't just be what's your secret because it may not be big, so it has to be what's your big secret. Okay. Anybody who's interested in this, by the way, I highly recommend listening to Elon Musk's fireside chat at TED. He talks about some of these ideas uh, with a lot more uh, clarity than I do. Okay, uh, last, last part. Uh, exponential outcomes require fundamental advantages. Um, most people, when they think of capitalism, in fact, I think if you talk to most people and said, what is capitalism, they would say, it is characterized by a world of limited resources and perfect competition for those resources and customers, or something like that. Um, I actually think the, the reverse is true. Um, true capitalism and competition are opposites, um, which is very counterintuitive, but in my experience, the better way to think about it. Um, a real capitalist gathers capital based on their unfair advantage, in my view. Um, a real capitalist doesn't compete a real capitalist leverages their unfair advantages uh, to avoid competing. Uh, I call it Jerry's Law of Capitalism. So Jerry Garcia was a local philosopher, uh, someone that I was a disciple of, but even back from my days at Stanford when the Grateful Dead uh, used to play concerts at Stanford. I look back on that, that was so freaking awesome. Thank God I went to those concerts because I would have <laughs> really regretted not going. But Jerry's Law of Capitalism is don't be the best, be the only. And uh, one thing I've seen happen so many times in Silicon Valley is the pitfall of mindless competition. And I don't care what we're talking about. I don't care if we're talking about startups. I don't care if we're talking about incubators, accelerators, whatever the, the new investment model du jour is. Mindless competition and following and imitation is endemic to a lot of what goes on here. And Whenever I look at a startup or I ever think about what should Floodgate be doing, I'm always thinking, be more like Jerry. You know, be more like Jerry Garcia and less like Attila the Hun. Um, because it turns out that perfect competition is not perfect, in fact. And that, um, I've got to be careful here. I say transcend competition because my dad used to work at Microsoft and before that IBM. The government sued him when he was at IBM and then he goes to Microsoft and then the government sues Microsoft for being a monopoly. And so he always warned me about not using that word. He said that, you know, when you use that word, it could come back to bite you someday. You can offend people. 
And so don't ever say that your goal is to invest in a monopoly. So just to be clear, on the record, I do not want to invest in monopolies. I only want to invest in people who transcend competition. And, uh, you know, and that means usually you've got to be at least 10 times better in some era, area with a defensible long-term advantage. And it also means, in my experience, that the distribution strategy is usually con congruent with the advantage somehow. Okay. So uh, uh, that's, that's probably all I have to say, except for one, one more thing. So one of the reasons I used Al was not just because of um, uh, the fact that he's exponential compared to Newton, who's more uh, linear, but uh, also, you know, he's an immigrant. And I don't know if many of you remember this, but um, Albert Einstein for a while had a hard time becoming a citizen of the U.S., which when you think about it, is, in hindsight, it's kind of crazy. Thank goodness that it actually happened and that we were able to benefit from his wisdom in a lot of ways. But, um, you know, I've been spending some time on this idea of immigration lately, and um, I think we have a pretty broken system right now, and I don't know what everybody's politics are. Uh, some of you may disagree, that's fine, we agree to disagree, but for those of you who happen to think we have a broken system, for those of you who get pissed off like I do when we send PhDs from Stanford and kick them out of the country, when they want to stay and start awesome companies. Uh, I think the conditions are in place to do something about it, not just talk about it. And so I've been working with uh, Mayor Bloomberg and a bunch of other folks on this idea of, of marchforinnovation.com. Some of you may have heard of it before, but if you're interested in getting involved in any way, uh, just go follow those links and hopefully uh, those of you who are interested in this uh, can play a role because I think it would um, have a huge positive impact if we, uh, if we made something happen and didn't just talk about it and bitch about it, but if we just got it. Done.